So can can everyone uh, see the screen? Give me a some kind of message if you can't see the screen. Okay, I'll assume then that everyone uh, everyone's good and we'll get started. Okay, so uh, our goal for this week is what I like to call advanced geometrical optics. But more or less, uh, the goal is to kind of use some of the matrix methods we've developed for polarization. We're going to try to develop uh, matrix methods that allow us to predict how light rays are going to be bent when they encounter a lens or a curved mirror or something like that. And the really useful thing about this is one, uh, it allows you to derive things that we've been using in lab and in class up to this point. For instance, we're going to be able to derive the thin lens equation, which is kind of cool from a physics standpoint, just to see where things come from. Uh, we're also going to be able to uh, figure out how the curvature of a lens actually determines the focal length. So we know how a lens is curved. Uh, so maybe the radius of the two curved surfaces on a lens. We'll be able to figure out what the focal length is from there using some of the methods we're going to derive today. The other, other thing that is, uh, makes this worth learning is that there are a lot of uh, computer simulation software out there that allows you to simulate a uh, geometrical optics problem. So, you know, put in a light source uh, and simulate the effect of a lens or a curved mirror or, a, you know, a parabolic reflecting surface. And they allow you to predict how rays at different angles will be bent and refracted and reflected, where focus focal points will be. And most of that software, uh, which you may, if you get an engineering job in the future uh, where you're working with optics, you might have to learn how some of that software works. Uh, most of that software is based on analyzing geometrical optics using uh, matrix and array based methods. So hopefully the lectures from this week will give you some background to how that kind of stuff works should you ever end up using it in the future. Uh, though using software like that won't be a focus of the course. Uh, the other thing that we're going to talk about later in the week is kind of some uh, stuff that's less physics, but more important to things like photography and uh, how to build lenses for cameras and different types of aberrations or errors lenses can make uh, when you're trying to get a good image and how you correct for those errors. So we'll talk about that too as we get into this later in the week. But we're going to start with kind of the more mathy, more physicsy stuff. And then at the end of the week, we'll kind of have a break where we get to talk about some uh, things relevant to photography. So uh, that's kind of where we're going. And uh, so uh, once again, chapters five and six in Hex book and the chapter 10 PDF for uh, Fowl's book in, uh, that's on Canvas. Uh, that's what we're going to be following along with for the next few days. So you don't have to copy all of this stuff down, but this is just kind of a basically to point out that we're going to be covering a lot of geometrical optics over the next few days, but we're only really skimming the surface. This is really a course about what I would call optics for experimental physics, where we're kind of picking and choosing stuff that's kind of important in a physics lab. Uh, but as you talk about lenses and different types of lenses, uh, for things like photographic applications or imaging applications, things can get quite complicated. And if you analyze lenses from a geometrical perspective, there's a lot of things we haven't even begun to cover. We talked about how there are two focal points, but there are situations where thickness of the lens, uh, for instance, uh, here, the thickness of the lens might be really important. And we might measure that thickness from the, you know, apex of the curved surface or maybe from the corners and depending on what we choose there's all these different types of uh, positions from which we can measure the different focal lengths on either side it could be from the apex of the curved surface or maybe from uh, this line in here which is called the uh, principal surface of the lens so 
once we start considering lenses that aren't thin, things get quite complicated. So I just want to point out here that we're kind of skimming the surface of geometrical optics. It could be a, like a semester long course in its own right. So we're going, I'm going to try to cover the stuff that I think is most critical for physicists and engineers to learn. And if you were going to do a, a degree or a master's degree in optics, or perhaps like some schools like the University of Rochester have an undergraduate optics program, you would end up taking a whole course in just geometrical optics that would cover all of this stuff. So just kind of a caveat here that we are just scratching the surface. So as a review of what we already know about geometrical optics and how we talk about uh, rays and how things like lenses affect rays, we can have an optical system which is often made of things like lenses and mirrors, could be flat, could be curved, uh, maybe flat blocks of glass that light refracts through. Regardless of what our optical system is, it's going to take our rays in our system, our rays of light, and change their direction. So we have a light ray that's going through. It might be focused or uh, diverged by a variety of lenses, depending on what type of lenses we have. So, a light ray has some kind of definite direction and definite position. So if we want to develop a way to talk about this and to predict what's going to happen, we need ways to talk about this direction and position. So in a sense, our light ray is a vector and we need to define that vector uh, as a given a position in space and its direction. Uh, we also have this thing called the optical axis. So roughly our light rays are K vectors and our optical axis is going to effectively be our origin. This is the thing that uh, the line that passes through the center of all of our lenses and mirrors are usually, not always, but usually that's the sensible way to define it. So we're going to use this as our origin. Our position and our angles for our light rays are going to always be measured relative to this uh, optical axis, this axis. And the last thing I wanna remind you guys of is that we're always going to make two assumptions. One is that the light ray is always very close to the optical axis. So that means uh, despite how it's drawn here, that light rays are always kind of hitting close to the center of the lens, not far to the outside. That's called the small displacement approximation. The other approximation we need is the paraaxial approximation, that the angle the light ray makes with the optical axis is fairly small, small enough that we can do the sine theta is approximately theta approximation. Uh, and once again, whenever, remember, whenever we use this approximation, we're assuming that theta is measured in radians whenever we use this. So we talked about this briefly before in lab when we were discussing light rays and geometrical optics, but I just wanna give you guys kind of a reminder of these basic assumptions for ray optics. Any questions so far? Okay, going once, going twice. All right, so moving forward then. Uh, so if we have like, you've seen this figure before as well. If we have like four mirrors arranged in this uh, rectangle and they're all uh, kind of right angles to each other, the optical axis will kind of form a rectangle here. Our light ray, depending on if we had a light ray hitting these mirrors. Let's not worry about how it got there in the first place, but let's say we have a light ray in there. At every point, the light ray is going to, depending on how the mirrors bend and cause the light ray to reflect, it's always gonna follow the law of reflection. But as you can see at different points in the system, the space between the optical axis and the light ray and the angle change. So those are the things that are critical. Every optical element, whether it be a mirror or a lens or so forth, will change this distance between the light ray and the optical axis 
and the angle that it makes. So those are going to be our two key parameters that we need to keep track of. So we're always going to, we're going to use these parameters to define our light ray mathematically. And we're going to do that by essentially defining this thing called a ray vector. So here's a zoomed in picture of our light ray from the previous slide. So down here is the optical axis. And the optical axis is always a black line and the light ray is going to be a blue line here. So here's our light ray. And so we're going to define the position of the ray at any given point. So Z is the propagation direction. X is going to be the distance between the light ray and the optical axis at any given point along the path. The angle the light ray makes, we'll call that theta. And so to define our light ray mathematically, we're going to define it as a column vector. So that column vector is going to look like this. The top component is going to be this distance x. The bottom component is going to be the angle theta. So the two components have different units, but let's not let that stop us. So basically, this defines all of our properties of our light ray traveling through the system. Any lens or mirror in our system is going to change both this position, the distance x of the ray from the optical axis, or the angle between the two. So we want to uh, build kind of a mathematical language that says, how can we represent if our light ray is a column vector? that's two by one as shown, how can we represent mathematically this lens or this lens or another mirror or whatever in the system? And you might be guessing here following along from our lectures last week on polarization that our optical elements that change our ray angle and position are going to be two by two matrices. So uh, a lot of our mathematics here from, uh, from polarization will carry over. And luckily, so there's gonna be a lot of uh, matrix algebra and matrix arithmetic here, but luckily everything's still two by two matrices. So more or less it's a, a simplest type of matrix algebra you can have is two by two matrix. So luckily that's all we have to deal with here. So basically, if we want to model a lens or some type of optical element in our system, we're going to have an equation that looks like this. We want to see our uh, column vector representing the ray before the lens. So like right before, at this position here, right before it hits the surface. That's going to be, uh, let me take my pen here. So we're going to consider this position right before the light ray hits the lens. So the distance, the position there from the optical axis and the angle are going to be what we put in here in this column vector. And I'll change my pen color second to use a... Then, so our lens here, which I'll highlight in green, that's going to be represented by this two by two matrix. We have to choose the elements A, B, C, and D such that they bend the ray correctly as the lens would. So we want to choose these elements such that this column vector here gives us this distance from the optical axis and this angle, which are going to be different. So this is the, uh, the idea here is that we're going to build up this uh, matrix uh, language for discussing how a lens or a mirror bends a light ray. So hopefully any questions on the terminology here? So x after lens is this distance. x before lens is this distance. 
similar with the angles. So we're measuring this before and after as the angle right before the lens. And the position is the position basically right before the lens. Any questions? Okay, going once, going twice. All right, so to uh, basically our goal is to get this matrix for a lens really, but we have some work to, uh, to get there first and kind of that uh, work also ends up being good, uh, makes for some good example problems. So we're going to, I'm going to try to work through a few of these problems for you to define the ray matrix for some simpler objects simpler than lenses. So other things that maybe can change or alter the position and angle of a light ray. So we're gonna do that first and that's going to help. We're gonna be able to use those results to build the result for a lens. So you don't have to copy this slide down, but I just want to kind of highlight some of the more mathematical nature of these, uh, these matrices that we're building. Each one of these different elements in uh, the matrix has a different meaning. And in particular, there are two that I want you to consider that we'll come back to later on. One is uh, the, the element A and the, and the other is the element D. They give us different types of magnifications. Essentially, A tells us how much does the, uh, does the element in question move the light ray away from the optical axis. D is telling us how much the angle changes compared to the incoming angle. So you don't really have to worry about the partial derivative notation here, uh, but there's, I just wanna give you these general properties of the ray matrix, that these diagonal elements, regardless of what we're defining, whether it be a lens, mirror, or so on and so forth, essentially tell us how that element is magnifying the position of the light ray as defined earlier or magnifying the angle as defined earlier. Of course, if we have more than the other general property to know is that if we have more than one lens or mirror or surface or whatever in our system, then we could define a matrix for every one of them. And if we want to define, if we want to figure out how that whole system affects our light ray, we just have to write uh, take that column vector and multiply by each one of those matrices. Again, the order is important here. So if we have the light ray hits object one, then object two, then object three, we have to multiply on the left by those matrices in this order. One first, and then matrix for object two, and then the matrix for object three. This, this uh, matrix uh, multiplication rule is going to be important when we're defining uh, matrices for big systems of optics. Uh, but again, that's just general matrix algebra rules and uh, uh, similar to what we did with the matrices for polarization. So the first thing, let's consider this uh, kind of like simple example here. We're just going to take, uh, basically you, you can define a ray matrix for everything. And in fact, just like some empty space with air in it is an optic in some way, shape or form. As the light ray propagates through that empty space, its properties change. Its angle stays the same, but however, its distance from the light ray does not. So as you can see here, uh, the distance at this point is shorter than after the light ray moves a distance z through air. The light ray moves further away from our optical axis, assuming it's at some non-zero angle. So light ray propagating through air does have properties that change. If we use the small angle approximation, so this uh, side of the triangle is z, uh, the angle, of course, does not change, but the position does. And we could figure out how the position changes by basically using some trigonometry here. 
So we'll call this angle theta in. And if we want to figure out how, uh, how much, what this uh, extra distance is, we could just use the tangent. So this extra distance here, let's call it delta x. So delta x is going to be equal to delta x over z, the adjacent side of the triangle will be equal to tangent of theta n. But if we use the small angle approximation, this is just theta n. So that gives us delta x to be z times theta n. So if we want to find the new position, distance from the, from the optical axis x out, we just have to take x in and then add this component here. So these are the two governing equations for how a light ray will change when it just moves through empty space. We can then just use some uh, rewriting using matrix notation. We could rewrite these two equations like so. And I'll leave this to you guys to just verify by multiplying these out, but hopefully you can see uh, how we get this result. So we want the position after the light ray moves a distance z and the angle out just through air or vacuum or any, really any material, as long as you start and end in that same material. This matrix is what we need. One's in the diagonal, the distance you move z in the upper right and a zero in the lower left. It will give you the correct result. So let me just uh, erase my uh, handwriting here. And so what we could say is for moving through free, free space, we could define this as the matrix that represents that process. Hopefully, is that clear to anyone? Any questions at this point? If you understand how we got this result, uh, then hopefully it'll, uh, it'll make sense how we define matrices for other things. If there aren't any questions here, the next thing I'd like to do is uh, take an example we know. So for instance, uh, a light ray hitting a flat surface going from air to glass or from one index of refraction to another and define a matrix representing that process. So any questions going once, going twice? All right, let's try the uh, second example then. So here's our, essentially this is our Snell's law problem. And so we're going to have a light ray coming in, hitting the glass at a certain point and refracting such that it get, bends closer to the normal. Uh, so we'll assume that N2 is greater than N1, but the result's general. So it could be N2 less than N1, same result will apply. The trick here is we're going to, we're not considering this, uh, the light ray is, uh, excuse me one second. This light ray is gonna propagate through free space uh, and then get right to this interface. This is where our problem starts. We've already figured out how to represent this propagation through free space with a matrix. We could do the same thing over here using the matrix from the last slide. Uh, what we want to consider for this problem is just the process, just the matrix that describes what happens right here from right before the glass starts to right after. So our two defining equations for this point are going to be the fact that from right before to right after, approximately the position of the light ray, the distance from the optical axis is more or less not going to change from right before to right after. Hopefully that's clear that then this is our first defining equation. X out is equal to X in. The thing that changes here is theta. So that changes according to Snell's law. 
Uh, but since we're using the paraaxial approximation, we're going to assume small angles. So our Snell's law equation, as far as our geometrical optics and our ray matrices are concerned, is going to be this equation here. So our two defining equations for, from which we want to build this next uh, matrix are going to be this one and this one. So I'm going to have you guys think about this for a bit. Uh, try to write it down in front of you. I'm just going to take a break talking for like two to three minutes. And try to put together what the matrix is going to look like. Think if you can. What I would suggest doing as a first step is to rewrite that second equation like so. So we're going to have on this side our input position and angle, some two by two matrix. And over here, x out, I'm just going to write O uh, for, to save some time, and theta out. What will the elements of our matrix be? If you want to type them in chat, you could type like A equals something, B equals something, C, and D. So work on this for a bit. I want this to be kind of like some group work. Uh, So when you get uh, when you get answers, you could text them to me privately or uh, or to the group through the chat. Okay, so so uh, Carrie texted an option to the uh, to the group here that you guys can uh, can check and compare to. So I agree with her answer. So if you uh, if you are getting something different, let's. Uh, talk about it now. But keep working for a bit. Uh, if you get the same answer as Carrie, then feel free, feel free to just say so. If you're getting something different though, I'd like to know so we could talk through the uh, talk through any issues you guys might have.
something that might help is going and uh, so taking this first equation, you might consider rewriting it like so. Hopefully, my uh, hopefully you can read this. I'm going to try to type it. So x out is equal to x in plus zero theta in. Okay, I'll try to make that color darker. Uh, How about, how about that? Does that help? So you'll notice here that we have a, a system of two equations and two variables. So here we have in terms of x out, in terms of x in and theta in. That should give us a and b. The second equation down here, the one boxed in blue, uh, with, uh, from Snell's law, that'll give us C and D. So you can see here, the, uh, the way you get these coefficients, A and B come from the uh, that one second a and b come from the coefficients of the variables in the first equation. So here we have one times x in plus zero times theta in. So this gives you a is one and b is zero. This equation here, we can rewrite it with a zero, throw in a zero x in plus all of this stuff. So that makes c zero, and then d is the coefficient of theta in, n one divided by n two. So is that kind of, is that clear to everyone how we convert? We get the matrix. Any questions from that? I'm just going to delete this handwritten matrix and give you the actual final result here so you can see it. Okay, let me uh, back. So that's the answer for the for the interface. So if we wanted to uh, if we now wanted to predict, if we wanted to start with the light ray here, with the starting position, a starting distance from the optical axis to be, here the optical axis is this dark line, solid line. We wanted to start with this being x in, and then over here, this distance being x out. What we would have to do is multiply by, we would have a free space matrix, multiplied by the interface matrix, multiplied by another free space matrix. So you can see, depending on where you start the beginning and end of the problem, uh, you may need to, free space itself is represented by a matrix, so you can't forget to include those matrices. Uh, I'll leave that to you guys as extra practice to do. So one more uh, example for today, which is going to help when we come back on uh, Wednesday, we're going to use this next example as the starting point to get the ray matrix for a lens. So if you, uh, let me get rid of that annotation here. So this next example is the one that's going to be really useful for us moving forward. So here we have a light ray that's again hitting 
a, a glass air interface, but this time it's curved. So we wanted to find the equations that determined x in, x out, theta in, theta out, and then rearrange them so we get the two by two matrix for the curved interface. The geometry problem here is a bit more complicated though, so I'm gonna kind of walk you guys through it. We're still going to assume that over here, N1 is air, N2 is glass, and we're going to just consider the problem of just going from right before the interface to right after. So our uh, equations for the problem, again, we're going to start with x out is equal to x in. And again, useful for a uh, One, give me one second. Uh, Zoom is not letting me move forward. The thing we have to keep track of here when determining the angles is that now the normal is not at the same angle as the optical axis. So when we do Snell's law, the angle from the normal is not going to be theta in. Theta out is not the refracted angle from the normal. We can get, we can relate it to those two angles, but we have to kind of do a little bit more geometry here. So the thing that's useful, theta one, we're gonna call theta one and theta two are angles from the normal. And the trick is we're to get our second equation for how theta out relates to theta in. We're going to need to use Snell's law for these two angles, theta one, theta two and then relate theta one and theta two to theta in and theta out. So useful variable here will be this other angle theta s. Uh, we're gonna call that the slope of the surface. So if the light ray was hitting right at this point at the optical axis, theta s would be zero. Uh, but we don't want to assume that. We want to assume not necessarily that's close to the optical axis, but not necessarily hitting directly on. So as the surface move, as we move away from the optical axis, the surface curves more and more relative to the axis. So theta s gets bigger and bigger. So theta s is going to be dependent on basically what x in is. And as you'll see here, theta s also appears over here. So you can write uh, theta one and theta two in terms of theta in, theta out. You could feel free to copy down these intermediate steps for the geometry problem or not. I think it's useful just as an example to see how to build a more complicated uh, ray, ray matrix. I'm also gonna take this, uh, I'm gonna call this, so we have, we're gonna assume this surface is spherical. So if uh, I draw the whole surface here, if I continue, I'm gonna assume we're propagating into like a spherical ball of glass. And we, the, we're just seeing like a little part here. Uh, if I continue kind of drawing this line, R here is going to be the radius of this surface. So from the center of this glass back to the surface, that distance is gonna be R. So going to the center of this sphere of glass. It's not the best geometrical drawing, but hopefully that makes sense to you guys. The reason why this is important is because this is generally how the curvature of the surfaces and lenses is determined by uh, having their determining what uh, the radius is, like what the radius for the sphere they would be a part of is. So here, this radius of curvature is defined like so. You take your lens or your curved surface and draw the sphere that it would be a part of. 
once we have that number, and uh, that's usually a number that lens makers or manufacturers can determine quite well. That's what they work with. Uh, you'll see here uh, that we can determine theta s in terms of x in and this radius r. Assuming the angle is small, which we're assuming all the angles are small, the ratio of this opposite side x in to this hypotenuse r will give us the angle theta s. So theta s is going to be x in divided by r. So that's this angle here. We're using an alternate interior angle identity and a trig function in the small angle approximation. So that using that result, we can rewrite these two equations as so. I'm gonna come right back to this. Let me go backwards on the slide so I could erase my drawing, if that's okay, so you can read these a bit more clearly. All right, and now we're back to where we were. Now the next step is to use uh, Snell's law to relate theta one and theta two. So here Snell's law, n one theta one in the small angle approximation, Snell's law is n one theta one is equal to n two theta two. And we could plug in the results from above to get us to this point. So now we have our two equations. So here, let me annotate again. So this first equation is up here. That's our x out is equal to x in, which we can rewrite as x out is equal to x in plus zero times theta in. And our second equation, uh, give me one second here, my mouse disappeared. And uh, I am now some like weird thing with Zoom, I think. Uh, anyway, our two equations, uh, I might need to, uh, Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry, technology problem. So here, our first equation for our matrix is going to be this guy. Our second equation, once simplified, solve for theta out is going to be this guy. These two allow us to build our matrix for this curve surface. So solving this equation for theta out, you guys can check me on this later. Gives us this. So the trick is you have to kind of uh, I'll let you guys work as we're nearing kind of the end for, of our time for today. But one thing you guys could do is you want to take these equations, take this equation and rewrite it, combine like terms for x in, and then pull out the coefficients. Those will give you the numbers C, this equation will give you the numbers C and D for the matrix. And this equation gives you A and B. So just like on the last slide, A and B are going to be one and zero. I'll leave it uh, to you guys to show C and D. So you guys can work through the, uh, the remainder of the algebra and arithmetic here. D is what we had before for the flat interface. But now, 
uh, C is no longer zero. That's the difference for the curved interface. So if we, if we want to model how a light ray hitting a curved interface will change, we have to use this matrix. If you guys want to, uh, that's kind of the last new thing I'm going to do for today. On Wednesday, which we'll still meet, uh, since there's not really much, given the circumstances, there's not really much point in advising day being like a day off. Plus, I kind of want to use the day to catch up. So plan on a lecture on Wednesday. And uh, what we're going to do is take these three results that we did today, these three examples. Most other matrices that we have to define can be built as just a combination of these three. And so we're going to talk about how, for instance, a lens is two curved surfaces uh, with maybe some space in between. So we can use the results today and do some matrix multiplication to get the matrix for this more complicated uh, thing called a lens. So uh, that's all that's new for today. If you guys want to hang out and work on your algebra and then check it with me before you leave, you're welcome to. I'll hang out. Otherwise, uh, that's our new material for today. These slides are posted uh, to the top of the Canvas page as well. And you'll see uh, one of the, let me get out of this presentation for a second. And you'll see one of the, uh, our first homework problem for this material, which will be due April 10th. Is here and basically it's fairly, uh, fairly straightforward, I think, uh, looking at some interesting properties of these uh, ray matrices. One in particular is what the determinants tell you. Uh, so for instance, the determinant of all of these matrices, regardless of how many devices you're in there, how many of these matrices you multiply together, you have 30 different lenses or you know, a variety of different curved surfaces with maybe a thick lens with space in between uh, that you can't ignore. The determinant always gives you the ratio of the starting refractive index to the final refractive index. So it's a nice little neat property. And so the first homework problem is really going to just be to check this with the matrices we defined. So you guys could kind of do that. It's a fairly quick problem. You could do that today if you wanted to. But I'm going to, that homework will be due as part of homework set uh, eight, I guess, which will be due on April 10th. And I think there will be like three problems for that. Okay, so if you wanna go back to uh, this problem, uh, that's all for the new stuff. And uh, we'll, I'll hang out for a bit if you wanna, if you have questions on the algebra here. If not, then we're done. Um, so I had a question about the homework that's due on the third. Yeah. Um, is that just three questions? Yeah, it's the three questions in those slides. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing one. No, uh, I, uh, I think I cut one question out, but it's the three questions that are in the slide set. Okay, awesome, thank you. And I'm going to do the same thing for the next homework set too. The questions will be in the slide set. Okay.
So um, I just have a question about uh, the matrix, ex- the matrix itself and its elements. Mm-hmm. Um, is this kind of derived from just being like a coordinate, like transformation, essentially? Essentially, it's a type of coordinate transformation, but one that's uh, very particular to the problem at hand. So, yeah, it's the reason why we can do this is because in the small angle approximation, all of our equations are linear. So Mm -hmm. the whole problem is defined by a system of linear equations. Any problem that's defined by a system of linear equations can be rewritten in terms of a matrix equation. So would this be the Jacobian? Essentially. Uh, so if, from a mathematical standpoint, uh, one second. Yeah, you may recognize this as a Jacobian or something very similar. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that, cool. That, that's kind of where I didn't want to get into that in this class because it's really not supposed to be, uh, you know, a mathematics class. But yes, this is, I think... I think you can kind of call this a Jacobian. All of these matrices are coordinate transformation matrices, but whether you have a lens or a curved surface or a flat surface, uh, how the the transformation is different. Okay. So, yeah, because I was looking at this and um, I'm using some of the free time that I have to continue studying like general relativity and tensors and whatnot. And this like looks exactly like the definition of like a, a vector transformation and how it's like invariant. Oh yeah, and it's actually uh, if you if you talk about like for instance different types of transformations in relativity, mm-hmm. uh, you know if you have a four vector and you can rotate it by multiplying by a rotation matrix. Yeah. But then there are other types of matrices where if you want to like invert it. Uh, or like reflect it, there's a thing called a parity matrix describing a parity transformation. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are translation matrices if you want to translate something in space. And if you want to do like a combination of rotation, translation, flipping something in space, you have to just multiply by those matrices in order, uh, one after the other, just like we're doing here. So yeah. uh, yeah, if you're noticing a connection between the mathematics there, uh, it's, uh, it is not just coincidental. This is a two by two kind of version, two by two classical version of, of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the fact that the transformations are linear that allow you to do that. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, that's a good, uh, it's a good connection. But yeah, math- mathematically, it's like, uh, each optical element in our system is like a, you know, a, tra- a, a transformation. It's not mm-hmm. a coordinate transformation. So it's kind of neat. Good that you're using the, uh, I'm actually using it's a lot of my extra time to go through a quantum field theory textbook that I've always wanted to look through. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's, I bet that's pretty, uh, pretty nuts. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I'll never get through it. I mean, I'll need like six epidemics to, to actually finish it. But <laughs> yeah. we'll see how much I get through. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it is kind of cool to notice that connection. So the, the reason these, uh, these connections here, uh, especially these partial derivative uh, definitions of the different components, all come from the idea of defining the matrix as a Jacobian. Mm -hmm. yeah that's what i thought was just really really interesting because i'm literally as we're speaking i'm looking at the uh the the vector transformation law Mm -hmm. basically and that like and like this is just basically defined like it's it's just cool seeing that this is exactly what it's basically saying you know neat when you see when you see mathematics that apply to these like seemingly unrelated problems but it's the same mathematics that's always mm-hmm. one of my favorite things about studying physics. Is yeah, it's cool making like those connections and whatnot. Mm-hmm. That's why yeah. I love physics. <laughs> yeah, nice catch.
uh, keep reading about uh, general relativity. It will uh, it will serve you well. Spending all this time. Oh yeah. Definitely want to do something something with my thesis involving general relativity. Yeah, I wish it's it's always something that I wish I was able to take an official course in, but that was the one thing I never got to take a course in. Mm -hmm. was, uh, there wasn't a big uh, big need at my graduate school, so they only offered it every few years, and uh, I missed the boat. Ah, uh, yeah. that happens. Alas, maybe I'll have time in the future. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Yep. All right. All right. I'm off to another meeting. So. Uh, Sounds good. Yep. We'll have a good rest of your day. Yeah. If you have any questions about any mathematics, I'm happy to send me an email. I'm happy to help if you come across something, assuming I can help. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't taken a course in general relativity, but be if you get it, have any questions, I'm always interested. So let me know. Awesome. Sounds good. I'll definitely take you up on that. All right. And I'll, uh, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Have a good day. You too.